Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Sawyer, um, Professor Webley. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your very warm introduction. I, I hope not to disappoint you tonight, although I dare not put forward an achievement as great as uh, your son's achievement in passing his driving test uh, as an achievement that still escapes me. Uh, <laughs> As I, I would also want to e e express my happiness at being here, uh, seeing here not only friends and colleagues from SOAS, but among them as well from outside the school, uh, former teachers, former students and friends who have come from abroad, including uh, Professors Kazimierz Waski, Ricardo Bellafiore, Gary Dimsky, Alberto Kilosi, uh, Arturo, Connell, and others. Among you is a small group of individuals who accompanied me on my first faltering steps into academic research. And I have to say, when I see the way in which my students here at SOAS get into research, you really do it far more single-mindedly than I ever did. Um, most prominent among those uh, who accompanied me on those first faltering steps uh, is Professor Anita Prasmovska, along with Miriam Prasmovska Toporovska. This lecture owes a huge amount to them and their generous support through the most difficult years of a career which was which is by no means been straightforward. Among more recent friends uh, are my research students. Their infectious enthusiasm, their absolute conviction that they will revolutionize in every sense, after all this is so as, this conviction that they will revolutionize economics, their dedicated assistance with my own research, seminars and projects, gives them a, a very special place in the genesis of my recent work uh, and of this lecture in particular. I should mention here in particular two friends who cannot be here. Professor Victoria Chick, whose friendship and scholarship were an important influence on the maturing of my ideas on monetary and financial economics. And Professor Tadeusz Kowalik, whose selfless dedication to the ideals of Oscar Lange and Michael Kaletsky have been an inspiration in my work and also a great comfort in some of my uh, in, in difficulties in the past. Uh, can I, before I get onto the substance of my uh, uh, lecture, I want to confess to, feelings, to, uh, to feeling a certain sadness uh, and even embarrassment uh, at delivering this inaugural lecture at, uh, I guess, but when I look around at the pro professors at SOAS, I, it seems to me, a, uh, for, in my case, it's at a rather advanced age. It seems to me that delivering this lecture at my age, uh, by and large, uh, means that, uh, well, it, it, uh, the sadness arises because we're deprived of the company of a number of individuals whose encouragement uh, meant an awful lot to me in the earliest years of my intellectual development. My father, for example, who instilled in me a love of books, uh, Francisca and Stefan Temerson, from whom I learned that modernism is the only consistent position for a serious intellectual. Tamara Deutscher, whose friend Marion Miliband uh, is, is with us today, from whom I learned that the true intellectual is also the engaged intellectual. Uh, my embarrassment, uh, border, bordering on inadequacy in delivering this inaugural lecture at my age, uh, is, uh, is also because you know, at my age, it usually indicates either delayed intellectual maturity 
or a lifetime of professional indiscretion. And I, I would like to think that it's, uh, uh, it's the latter. <laughs> Nevertheless, one, one tries to make the best of this predicament and seeing its certain advantages. Uh, for example, by now I've learned, I've attended a number of inaugural lectures. You know, the, the older you, you are when you get to it, the more inaugural lectures you will have attended. Uh, and I've learned from them that I, I should not use PowerPoint, not because it necessarily trivializes the points in this lecture that I would like you to remember, but because I cannot confidently deliver it without technical difficulties or trivializing. So you'll just have to listen to me. As was mentioned before, my, this lecture is at, has come in various versions. The original version, uh, the original lecture was going to be uh, about probably my main contribution, what I've uh, 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 mostly contributed uh, on, which is the topics of money and finance, uh, the, the, the subject of most of my books uh, and articles. Uh, and I did start sketching something out. Uh, and at that time I thought, uh, well, of course, the ideal person then to comment on this is uh, Professor Arturo O'Connell from the Central Bank of Argentina. But he couldn't... Uh, uh, he wasn't sure at that time whether he could make it. And uh, as I reflected on it, I thought, well, no, you know, I have my doubts as to the significance of my contribution to uh, finance, financial economics, and monetary economics. But I have absolutely no doubts about uh, the contributions of Michael Kaletsky and Oscar Langer. I have no doubts about their contributions. And also this lecture gives me the opportunity to give at least a partial answer to the question which uh, those of you that have known me for a long time, Malcolm in particular, uh, you know, have asked on more than one occasion, uh, what has Toporovsky been doing these last two decades with his research on Kaletsky? Well, this is uh, the starting point of an answer. So let me move on to the substance of my lecture. Oscar Langer and Michael Kaletsky, as is well known, uh, were the most distinguished of 20th century Polish economists. However, I want to emphasize that I'm talking about them today not because they were Polish, uh, there is, I think, no such thing as a national school uh, in economics. The ideas of professional economists in Poland in the 1930s, when Kaletsky and Lange were coming to, ma to maturity in their ideas, those, the ideas that were in currency then in Poland and now, like the ideas of most economists in most countries of the world, were and are largely derivative. That is, they're a pale reflection or application of the ideas of uh, what Keynes called defunct economists from the past or from some other country. Uh, yet Langer and Kaletsky were anything but derivative. Um, so they, they, was, they were unusual. Uh, what, if, if I come back to this issue of uh, national schools, what we call national schools of thought in economics, the Austrian school, the Swedish schools, um, really uh, can just as easily derive from the ideas of particular creative individuals around whom those national schools developed. Karl Menger, Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich von Hayek, in the case of the Austrian school, uh, Knut Wicksell, Bertil Olin, and Gunnar Myrdal in the case of the Swedish school. Uh, and this idea of a national school is, uh, uh, is false because if you look, for example, at um, 
more recent Austrian economists, the most recent Austrian economists, they're not even mean Central Europeans, Murray Rothbart, Israel Kirchner, uh, a famous Austrian, so-called Austrian economists, are actually Americans. Um, they, uh, if we go back into the 19th century, the political economist and editor of The Economist, uh, Walter Badgett, what he referred to as English political economy was in fact founded by the Scot Adam Smith in Glasgow and not in England. And as an aside, I cannot resist uh, quoting from Badgett. Badgett commenced his essay uh, on the postulates of English political economy, uh, published in 1876. He began this uh, essay with the words, Adam Smith completed the wealth of nations in 1776, and our English political economy is therefore just a hundred years old. <laughs> uh, I think in, in, in most cases it is more correct to refer not to national schools, but to the main centres where the ideas of the founders of those schools, uh, uh, where, where those ideas were promulgated. There's not a Swiss school of, uh, of thought in economics, but there is a Lausanne school around the ideas of Leon Walras and Wilfredo Pareto. Uh, the Swedish school is more correctly called the Stockholm School, following the founding uh, 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 it's, it's the, the, the Stockholm School in Britain, following the founding of English political economy in Glasgow the distinctive English contribution to modern economics in the work of John Maynard Keynes, Joan Robinson, Richard Kahn, was more correctly called by Harry Johnson and my first economics teacher, Terence Hutchison, the Cambridge School. And this developed around the ideas of Alfred Marshall, whose methodological principles underlie the so-called Keynesian revolution. But even here there are ambiguities. Harry Johnson's, uh, uh, Harry Johnson for those that are, are not of a certain age, Harry Johnson was a great monetarist uh, economist who um, dueled with the Keynesians in the 1970s. Uh, Harry Johnson's major accusation against the post-war Cambridge School was that its central ideas were really cooked up outside Cambridge by the Pole, Michael Kaletsky. So Oscar Lange and Michael Kaletsky were great economists precisely because they transcended their national background. They were concerned to apply uh, economic theories uh, to econ economic problems and development issues of their native country, but their starting point was their effort to understand the economics of capitalism in general, that is, capitalism as it existed in their time in Western Europe and North America, and as it was emerging in the developing countries. It is this understanding of international capitalism that gives contemporary significance to the ideas of Lange and Kaletsky. Likewise, it is the failure of many lesser theoreticians to transcend the commonplace observations of their home countries that condemns their ideas to a lesser significance. One is reminded of Schumpeter's comment on Marshall, uh, a highly polished surface in which everything is reduced to the commonplace. What a condemnation. <laughs> typically uh, Schumpeterian condemnation. I'm therefore bringing these two economists to your attention, not because they are Polish, but because their Polishness has, I believe, obscured the central message of their economics for the 21st century. We may examine their key English language texts, and they will have meaning uh, for connoisseurs of inevitably 
outdated socialist planning debates or post-Keynesian economics, uh, uh, the context in which they're mentioned today, uh, but to find meaning in their work for, their for the 21st century, it is necessary to dig deeper into their writings in Polish and their debates with other economists. So let me, st uh, just a let me start with the younger of the two men, Oscar Langer. He was born in 1904 to a textile factory owner in Tomaszów near the Polish industrial city of Łódź, then part of the Russian Empire. His family was originally from Germany, but had become assimilated into Polish society, although his parents remained Protestant. In his adulthood, he became a Marxist. Uh, sorry, in his adulthood, after he became a Marxist, a myth grew up that Langer was Jewish, since according to Polish anti-Semites, communism is merely a part of a much greater Jewish conspiracy against the Polish people. Again, I'm reminded of Keynes's remark uh, for, uh, which, uh, the, uh, for which he was widely, con uh, one of the reasons why Keynes was widely disliked in Poland. Uh, Keynes's remark that Poland is an economic impossibility whose only industry is Jew baiting. Uh, there's actually much more to Poland than that. <laughs> in particular Lange and Kalecki. Uh, Lange's Jewish connection was actually much stranger than this. Uh, a file on him that was built up by an anti-communist organization uh, during the war reveals that Lange's father uh, had a Jewish bookkeeper who kept the firm's accounts in Yiddish, an obscure German dialect that's written in the Hebrew alphabet. Langer's father was not comfortable uh, with having his firm's books in a language and with symbols that he could not understand. So he set his linguistically gifted son uh, to learn Yiddish, one of many languages which he was to master. So this is, this is the origin of uh, uh, Langer as uh, why Langer was considered Jewish. Tuberculosis of the bone marrow left Oscar a sickly child who took refuge in books and was eventually sent to a sanatorium near Graz in Austria for treatment. He returned to complete his school education in wartime Poland under German occupation, I mean the, 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 the First World War. By the time Poland achieved independence in 1918, the young Langer was reading the Marxist classics and active in socialist circles. After studying in Poznań and Kraków, he proceeded to doctoral studies in Kraków in statistics and economics. Thereafter, he lectured and was active in a small socialist group that considered itself more radical than the national, uh, 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 than the uh, uh, much larger uh, national Polish Socialist Party, but although they were more, uh, they were much more left-wing than the Polish Socialist Party. Uh, it, the the organisation, Langer's organisation, was also very critical of the strategy and the organisation of the Polish so uh, of the Polish communists. In 1936, Langer left Poland to travel to the United States on a Rockefeller Fellowship, ending up as an associate professor of economics at the University of Chicago, where his best known students were uh, Hyman P. Minsky and Richard Milhouse Nixon. Yes, an, an odd pair. Uh, he became an American citizen and threw himself into American politics in particular supporting the war against Nazi Germany. After 1940, in 1944, after the Polish government in exile broke off relations with the Soviet Union following the discovery of mass graves of Polish army officers 
killed by the NKVD at Katyn in, in Belarusia. Langer unexpectedly flew to Mo Washington where he met President Roosevelt and then flew on to Moscow for, for talks with Joseph Stalin. At the end of the war, he was nominated as the first ambassador of communist Poland to the United States uh, and was obliged eventually to resign his American citizenship. After two years, he became head of the Polish delegation to the United Nations. In 1948, at the last Congress of the Polish Socialist Party, uh, he renounced his earlier views on socialism and urged affiliation with the communist Polish Workers' Party. He spent the Stalinist years in Warsaw lecturing at the Party School of Social Sciences before emerging into public life uh, again, uh, before emerging into public life again with de-Stalinization in 1956. He participated cautiously in discussion on economic and political reform, ending up as the chairman of the Council of State, uh, equivalent to President of the Republic. His health was never good, and he died undergoing treatment in Rome in 1965. In his economic analysis, Langer was the archetype of the mainstream economist, but with a radical twist. There were few aspects or notions of orthodox uh, the orthodox economic theory of his time uh, that he could not turn to proving the necessity for socialism. This perhaps explains why he fitted in so well at Chicago. He and Henry Simons and Frank Knight and Aaron Director, the, the other main uh, luminaries of uh, Chicago economics, uh, uh, all of them believed that free market competition could bring about the holy grail of neoclassical economics, a full employment general equilibrium. Langer only dissented from his fellow professors because he believed that the processes of concentration and centralization of capital, which Marx had argued would, would limit the self-expansion of capital, these processes were eliminating the, the kind of flexibility of prices and wages uh, that was necessary to secure full employment equilibrium. Okay. Langer today is best known for the model of the socialist economy that he put forward in his well-known controversy with Hayek. Hayek had argued that socialism is impossible because the central planning authority in a socialist economy could not solve the, the complex equations needed to obtain the prices that would bring supply equal to demand in all markets. Langer argued that it was, it was not necessary to solve these equations. All that the central planner had to do was to follow a rule, simply follow a, 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 a simple rule, uh, in which, according to which they raised prices if shortages emerged, and lowered them if there was excess supply. Indirectly, uh, Alanga dug, even if he didn't lay, uh, the foundations of today's information theoretic economics, because it was in response to Alanga that Hayek wrote his essay. Uh, his famous essay on the use of knowledge in society in 1945, where he argued that uh, information is not equally available to everyone. Information comes from a process of discovery by entrepreneurs rather than the state. Uh, however, it is worth recalling uh, Langer's earlier model of the socialist economy, which he co-authored co with a monetary economist, Marek Breit, who had fallen into the Lang, Lange Kalecki circle in Warsaw in the early 1930s. Their article, published in 1935, had a number of not notable features. 
first of all, in it, Langer uh, and Bright enunciate their view that the reason why the capitalist economies of the 1930s would not naturally uh, spring back to full employment was because cartels and monopolies were preventing the adjustment of prices and wages that would make all markets clear at full employment. Secondly, they criticised the Soviet system of planning through central ministries, which according to Lange and Bright, allowed certain groups of workers to exploit monopoly power and secure higher wages for themselves at the expense of other groups of workers. Uh, this was a feature of Eastern European communist economies where certain workers such as uh, miners uh, uh, and workers in heavy industry enjoyed significantly higher earnings uh, than workers in, uh, in other industries. Actually, this, was, uh, this criticism of, of, uh, of the Stalinist model was, uh, uh, was one that uh, uh, Langer in later years went to great trouble to, to try to hide uh, in, in successive editions of this uh, uh, essay. As an alternative, Langer and Bright urged the organisation of industry into autonomous trusts that were not quite syndicalist because their ruling boards would contain representatives of all social groups. But their activity would be coordinated by the market and in a striking anticipation of 21st century political economy, uh, the coordination would come in two ways, through the market and through the central bank. Uh, as, uh, as with the 21st century new consensus on monetary policy, the central bank would regulate the level of investment and aggregate economic activity by varying the rate of interest. One wonders today whether central bank socialism uh, would work any better than central bank capitalism, although it, it, it was, I believe, uh, there was talk of it in Hungary in the, in the dying years uh, of the Hungarian uh, as, uh, communist, uh, of, of the Kadar regime in Hungary. I will pass over to other aspects of Langer's work that may interest the historian of economic thought, both of them emerging in response to the ideas of John Maynard Keynes. There is, first of all, Langer's interpretation of Keynes's general theory in price flexibility and employment. Uh, this was a book, booklet that he published in 1943. And this became one of the founding documents of the neoclassical synthesis. Uh, that came to be ritually denounced in later years by Joan Robinson and the post-Keynesians. At the time, uh, Kalecki rejected the Langer view uh, as an incorrect interpretation of Keynes. Uh, Langer also earlier intervened in the Keynes-Tinbergen dispute about the scope and significance of econometrics. Uh, but these are less appropriate for discussing before a general audience, uh, before the kind of general audience that we have today. But since we are at SOAS, let me conclude with a few words, uh, let me conclude on Langer with a few words on his development economics. Langer came to development economics rather later in life. Uh, after he and Poland emerged from Stalinist isolation, in 1956, Langer traveled widely to Latin America and then he followed Nicholas Caldor to India and Sri Lanka, then, then Ceylon. In India and Ceylon, he warmly endorsed Caldor's taxation reforms to raise government revenues and close the fiscal deficit. However, in his development economics, uh, Langer stayed close to the orthodoxy that he had embraced in the 1940s for Poland, namely that economic development depended in large countries upon the amount of resources devoted to investment in general, 
and heavy industry in particular. However, smaller countries were, in his view, more constrained by their foreign trade position and would require import restrictions in order to develop. An intriguing aspect of Langer's development e economics were the discussions that he had towards the end of his life with Italian economists on the issues of regional economic development in the Italian Mezzogiorno. So let me move uh, now on to Kaletsky. Uh, Michael Kaletsky and Oscar Langer had more in common than their intellectual root roots in the discussions of the Zvyonzek Niezalefne Mojefe Socialistichne, the Union of Independent Socialist Youth at the beginning of the 1930s, where they met for the first time. Although actually Lang uh, Kaletsky was never a member uh, of the organization, but he, he hung around in those circles. Uh, actually, they had far more in common than this. Um, Kaletsky's father, Abram, too, was a factory owner. But the Kaletsky factory was in the middle of the Polish industrial city of Łódź, which was also the second city after Moscow to be affected by the 1905 revolution. Abram Kaletsky's uh, business never recovered. And in 1911, he shut down the factory. Unlike Langer, Michael Kaletsky lived in financial insecurity up to 1929, when he secured employment at the Institute for the Study of Business Cycles and Prices, uh, a rare oasis of economics research in Poland at a time when university professors devoted themselves to teaching and sustaining the higher culture that they believed themselves to represent. I didn't produce, but you just sustain the culture. Uh, <laughs> in 1936, uh, this was what the, of course, the research assessment exercise has put a firm stop to. <laughs> uh, in 1936, Kaletsky left Poland along with Langer to go abroad on a Lock Rockefeller fellowship. While Langer headed for the United States, Kaletsky went to Stockholm to study the, the credit cycle theories of the Swedish followers of Knut Fixell. While there, Kaletsky received news of the publication of Keynes's uh, general theory. Among the founding myths of post-Keynesian economics is the story put out by George Shackle and Joan Robinson that Kaletsky was so shocked to see Keynes's theory, uh, was so shocked to, uh, to see that Keynes's theory had beaten his own to the publisher that Kaletsky took to his bed for a week. Uh, the book did shake Kaletsky, but more with a realization that the key discussions on macroeconomics were now no longer in Stockholm, but were in London and Cambridge. So Kaletsky left Stockholm and came to London, lodging just on the other side of Russell Square in Guildford Street. In fact, uh, in late, uh, uh, towards the end of her life, uh, Kaletsky's widow told me that they, they arrived in Guildford Street, um, put their bags down, and uh, uh, being who they were, put their bags down, headed straight for Trafalgar Square for a demonstration in support of the Spanish Republic. So they knew which, uh, 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 they knew which side to be on. Uh, he wrote to Joan Robinson after reading her analysis of hidden unemployment and she was so impressed by his understanding of Keynesian ideas that she introduced him to Keynes. Uh, uh, Keynes and Mrs. Keynes invited Michael and Adela Kaletsky for tea at the rather ugly house in Harvey Road, Cambridge, owned by Keynes's parents, uh, uh, the, uh, the a house that John Maynard Keynes occasionally used when he was in Cambridge. Joan Robinson, anxious to know what impression her protégé had made on the great man, uh, for her, Keynes was always a great man, even when, after Keynes died, she concluded that Kaletsky had the better intellect. Uh, 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 Joan Robinson asked Kaletsky, uh, how was the tea with Keynes? And 
uh, and what impression had he of the great man? Uh, Kalitsky, repli uh, Kalitsky replied that the tea was fine, uh, the, the, that Keynes was like a prima ballerina, and Mrs. Keynes was like a Cambridge don. <laughs> uh, Keynes supported uh, uh, Kalitsky after the expiry of his Rockefeller Fellowship, while confusing to being confused, sorry, while, while confessing to being confused by some of Kalitsky's ideas. Uh, and in this context, I cannot resist quoting this remark from a letter of Keynes to Kahn, dated the 30th of April 1938, referring to uh, what, what Keynes called Kalitsky's appalling method of exposition. Uh, uh, Keynes wrote, his mathematics seems to be largely devoted to covering up the premises and making it extremely difficult to bring one's intuition to bear. If only he would state his premises in the most illuminating possible manner and be perfunctory over his mathematics instead of the other way around, uh, one would have a better idea of what he is driving at. Well, of course, in Keynes's uh, writings, it was the other way around, very much so. Uh, Keynes secured for Kalecki a stipend from the National Institute for Economic and Social Research to do research at Cambridge and subsequently after the outbreak of the Second World War in Oxford. At the end of the war, Kalecki moved to Canada to work with the International Labour Organization and then to New York where, uh, where he worked for the United Nations. As the Cold War chilled the atmosphere of, uh, of multilateral organizations such as the UN, Kalecki became subject to political pressure over the IMF and World Bank policy and reports that he wrote on member countries. He was spied upon and the Secretary General, Dag Hammarskjöld, refused a request by the Mexican government for Kalecki to visit Mexico as an expert advisor. Uh, in 1955, uh, he resigned and returned to Warsaw to take up a key role advising the government there on economic planning. For a while with de-Stalinization, things went well. But in the 1960s, when the economy started ex to experience difficulties, Kalecki's criticisms of excessive investment proved less tolerable. Uh, in 1968, many of his associates were subjected to an anti-Semitic purge, lost their jobs, in many cases were given passports valid for only one journey out of Poland, uh, effectively deprived of their nationality. Uh, among them, Kazimierz Waski, who is with us here today. Kalecki resigned from his official positions made one last journey to England and died in Poland in 1970. Although he had little scholarship about himself, Kalecki was a much more original thinker than Langer, who had a, uh, uh, although, although Langer had the encyclopedic knowledge of economic theory. Kalecki is perhaps best known for having anticipated in some way Keynes's general theory. The anticipation was hailed after Keynes's death by Joan Robinson and was claimed in private by uh, Kalecki himself. The real story is a complex one that reveals much about the respective personalities of the two men, but actually very little about their ideas. Part of the complexity arises from the very ambiguity of Keynes's ideas. Even his most ardent followers admit that there are different interpretations of Keynes, so that denouncing incorrect interpretations of Keynes is today as common among Keynes's followers as denunciations of deviant interpretations of Marx are widespread among Marx's, Marx's followers. It is, however, possible to identify in the general theory and in Kalecki's work uh, key ideas that they had in common. The first is that in a capitalist economy, output and employment are determined by business investment. 
so that unless investment is high enough, the economy is unlikely to be at full employment. Secondly, that investment determines saving rather than the other way around. Both men denounced the, doc uh, the doctrine of the social value of thrift that so comforted the complacent Victorian bourgeoisie and that has made such a comeback today. Finally, contrary to the neoclassical and the Ricardian Marxist view, both men argued that wage rises would increase employment rather than decreasing it. Underlying this commonality of view on how the capitalist economy works uh, was a fundamental principle of economic method that Kalecki explicitly employed to great effect and Keynes in a somewhat more haphazard way, the principle of the circular flow of income. This is the idea that incomes are determined by expenditure decisions rather than being decided in complex games of exchanging uh, resources, capital or labour. The principle goes back to the work of the French physiocrat François Canet, but has been lost to political economy, or had been lost to political economy by the 19th century with the, with the ascendancy of the idea that prices integrate the individual, uh, that prices integrate individual exchange decisions. So all you need are the correct prices. Nevertheless, a hundred years ago, the great Joseph Schumpeter recognized the importance of the circular flow of income. The principle he declared showed how, in, how each economic period becomes the basis for the subsequent one, not only in a technical sense, but also in the sense that it produces exactly such results as will induce and enable the members of the economic community to repeat the same process in the same form in the next economic period. How economic production comes about as a social process. As long as economic periods were viewed merely as a technical phenomenon and the fact of the economic cycle through which they move had not been recognized, the connecting link of economic causality and the insight into the inner necessity and the general character of economics was missing. It was possible to consider the individual act of exchange, the phenomenon of money, the question of protective tariffs as economic problems, but it was impossible to view with clarity the total process which unfolds itself in a particular economic period. This is Schumpeter writing in 1912. Sadly, that principle has been lost again with the new classical economics, new Keynesians, uh, the, new, the new neoclassical synthesis and others, all of them returning to the, the classical position in which, for better or for worse, but largely worse, prices rather than the circular flow of income are held to integrate economic decisions. However, the similarities between Kane, Kaletsky and Keynes should not blind us to the the differences in their respective approaches. Keynes, the moderate conservative, uh, was ever enthusiastic about the possibilities of possibilities that would, uh, sorry, the possibilities of policies that would allow capitalism to flourish as it needs to if it is to provide full employment. Kalitsky was more skeptical. He accepted that fiscal and monetary policies could pr provide some stimulus to business investment but he did not regard uh, 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 he, he did not regard the, uh, the, this as a sustainable position in the long run. More importantly, he doubted the willingness of business to support a regime of full employment. He also criticised Keynes's weak understanding of industrial investment processes and corporate finance beyond stock market operations. Unlike Keynes, Kalecki did engage with the problems of developing countries. Kalecki also distinguished himself from Langer in emphasizing that the central problem of economic development uh, uh, is a financial one, but not the saving constraint that has exercised development economists from the time of Gustav Cassel onwards. For Kalecki, the financial constraint 
appears, appeared in the first instance as a foreign exchange boundary on the amount of investment and consumption goods that may be imported. In the second place, the financial constraint emerged out of the social structure of the economy. Growth in employment at low levels of income would put pressure on food supplied by the agricultural sector. The resulting food price inflation would redistribute income towards farmers and through higher rents to landowners. The higher food prices would therefore fail to stimulate food supplies. This made land reform and the taxation of landowners and the middle classes a prerequisite for successful industrialization. Uh, Kalitsky was also skeptical of the benefits of foreign direct investment in fostering the modernization of the economy. Okay, let me come to my conclusion. In a lecture in, in 1951, uh, uh, just remind, I think it was J.K. Galbraith who said uh, uh, the words, let me come to a conclusion, uh, words which are spoken by the lecturer in a bid to give his audience hope. Uh, so, uh, um, as my, uh, my, in, in a lecture in 1951, Langer described Kalecki as a left Keynesian. This was the term employed at the time by communists to describe those followers of Keynes, like Joan Robinson, who were sympathetic to Marxism but recognized the possibilities of Keynesian management of capitalism. Langer's own use of the term was not ironic, but may, be uh, but may be viewed as such. This was a neoclassical Marxist who helped establish the neoclassical synthesis, pigeonholing a much more radical and original critic of capitalism, which all goes to show we may use labels for convenience, but they're rarely illuminating. More generally, the incident and the comparison between the two scholars shows that while it's helpful for the development of ideas and analysis for economists to do battle over theory and concepts, it's not helpful to take that battle and such name calling into the domain of public discussion. In the domain of politics, battles over economic policy must be conducted rhetorically with an appeal to the ideas and currency among the political audience rather than with an appeal to theoretical consistency. Economists have to be aware that in entering public debates, they need to use rhetoric rather than analysis. But in using rhetoric and appealing uh, to the often uninf uninformed sentiments of their audiences, uh, economists need to avoid two traps. One trap lies in becoming what Keynes called agitators or mere economic journalists purveying the warmed up ideas of others and encouraging an uninformed sentiment. The other trap lies in dogmatism or an insistence on the acceptance of certain doctrines whose rationale and application cannot be explained. Kalecki and Langer may be, caref uh, may be usefully read today as examples of economists whose writings avoid those traps. Although both wrote complex and difficult studies in economics, uh, their arguments are radical in the sense that they do not require prior acceptance of initial premises or doctrines. This has become all too rare in a profession divided into schools of thought in which particular schools are identified by the doctrines which they do not question. Uh, the mainstream defined by its uh, 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 defined in scope by market clearing prices, Austrians defined by doctrines of entrepreneurship, post Keynesians defined by doctrines concerning uncertainty, expectations, endogenous money, one could go on. A very positive side of Langer's work deserves to be recovered today. This is in his engagement with all economics. He did not disengage with the mainstream economics of his time, but challenged it and even employed it to draw much more radical conclusions 
than his mainstream colleagues would allow. A, per a particular need in the 21st century is the urgent need to recover Kalecki's vision and the integrating principle of the circular flow of income. Without it, economists have regressed to those Victorian values that celebrate the alleged thrift of the rich. Uh, when a self-professed New Keynesian like the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, attributes the macroeconomic imbalances, the so-called macroeconomic imbalances, the US economy, and even the financial crisis since 2008, uh, to the so-called Chinese savings glut. It's apparent that the economics profession needs followers of Kalecki to point out that the Chinese people were never so wealthy nor earned on a sufficient scale to distort the American economy in the way alleged by Bernanke. In our development economics of the 21st century, we need to return to Lange and Kalecki's vision of economic development in traditional society as a social process, uh, a, a vision that emphasized economic development as changing social structures rather than merely adding to the endowments of individuals. I have a particular and personal agenda in, in pursuing my research on Kalecki. This, agen this agenda is to recover for the 21st century the monetary theory of Kalecki, rooted in Vixelian business cycle theory rather than in the functionalist approach to money that has been predominated in British and North American economics. Central to the Vixelian business cycle approach is the idea that the most important money which determines the scale of investment, employment and economic dynamics is put into circulation by business and not by governments or central banks. Again, if I can quote Schumpeter, uh, I, I guess I should apologize for quoting Schumpeter more than I've quoted Kalecki. Um, but he was, uh, uh, he was in the same class, really. They're all in the same class. It may be, uh, as Schumpeter put it, it may be more useful to look upon capitalist finance as a clearing system that cancels claims and debts and carries forward the differences. In other words, practically and analytically, a credit theory of money. This is perhaps the key theoretical distinction between Kalecki and Keynes. Behind Kalecki's analysis was a vision of credit as a clearing system of capitalist finance, whereas his preoccupation with policy and his own financial investments restricted Keynes's monetary vision to the clearing of payments between commercial banks and the central bank. Thus, in the 21st century, as our economic ills are blamed even by the leading theoreticians of the economics profession on the parsimony of the Chinese, the extravagance of Greeks, Spaniards, Portuguese, and Italians, the prodigality of governments, the greed of workers, excessive regulation, and limited foresight, we should read Lange and Kalecki to remind ourselves that the economics uh, that economics has to start with the functioning of capitalism in its leading countries and emergent capitalism in developing ones. Only on this, from this foundation can we build theories of economic and monetary relations. Uh, on a final note, let me just um, uh, conclude with the, f uh, uh, with the following thought. Research can only be as good as the people with whom the researcher associates, associates. I may have delivered this lecture, but the good things in it I owe to Kalecki and Langer, to all those who've encouraged my interest in Kalecki, most notably Malcolm Sawyer and Jeff Harcourt, but also Julio Lopez, Nomi Levy, John King, Tracy Mott, my brilliant research students, Jago Penrose, Luigi Ventimiglia, Eva Kavovsky, Joe Mitchell, Mimosa Shabani, and Ilara Mahdi, who, who have served with great patience and forbearance as a captive and very active audience for the discussion of my ideas. And finally, 
Uh, and uh, last but not least, I owe those ideas to the person who will come after me, Professor Kazimierz Waski. Thank you very much. It is a great honor to me, for me to, be, to, be, to have been invited here to this ceremony. I understand that this privilege is linked to the fact that I had the occasion to uh, knew personally both of these economists and to work for about dozens of years with Professor Kalecki. <clears throat> Let me start with some personal uh, informations which may be interesting for you, and then I will make two comments more on theoretical, in theoretical sense. It is true that Lange was the deputy chairman of the State Council in Poland, but this was a position a politically without practically any weight, mostly representative. Further, he was not Jewish, but his link with Jews went beyond the Georgius anecdote about the bookkeeper of his father, as told by Professor Toporowski. Oskar Lange's first wife, Irena, was Jewish. She went together with him to the United States, but after the war, she did not return together with him back to Poland. She and their son remained in the United States. His second wife, Felicia, was not Jewish. Now a few anecdotes about Kalecki. Uh, after his uh, lectures, uh, there were questions, and sometimes, if questions have been asked, Kalecki answered exactly with the same words as in the lecture. He was a very bad teacher in the sense that he could not understand that people don't understand his reason. So he repeated what he said, but louder. <laughs> the second uh, anecdote is when I learned that his uh, work in the planning commission goes to the end because he didn't want. They treated him as a, well, as a showman to show, look, what a great economist we have as a as an advisor, but this was not Kalecki to play such a role. So he stopped, and at that moment, the idea came to me to win him for the university. Kalecki was never an a, a, a university teacher, never, outside this period when he was in the main school of planning statistics between about 57, 56, and 60, and 70 when he retired. Well, so I had a great, great, great difficulties to convince him that he lectures to students, and the end I, I, I mastered, I, I got his consent, but after a few days he phoned to me, uh, oh, well, this, uh, this uh, what we made up was two hours a week, one semester, capitalism, one semester, 
socialism because uh, academic year in Poland has two semesters. After a few days, he phoned to me and he says, I cannot agree. So what happened? He says, I don't have enough ma material to teach two hours a week. <laughs> so you see, a normal professor teach six hours, but then uh, uh, tells everything about the topic, but Kalecki was able not only to speak about himself, about what he discovered himself. So I had the idea and said, Professor, uh, Mr. Professor Kalecki, please, you will teach one hour, and the other hour, you will answer questions. So, as questions were not always asked, he asked himself some questions and answered them. <laughs> By the way, I see here in the audience somebody who can say, who, can, who was at that time in Poland, Professor Kilozzi. Uh, another anecdote. Uh, during this time were uh, great discussions in Poland after 56 and before the system changed to the worse about workers, uh, uh, about, giving the, about increasing the role of workers in administration in, uh, uh, of, of firms. And Kalecki uh, Lange was the chief of the so-called Economic Council, and the two uh, people who were uh, vice president were Professor Bruce and Professor Kalecki. Bruce was very enthusiastic about introducing market economy elements into the socialist planning system. Kalecki was not so. Kalecki understood that if reforms would be indeed deep, making the markets influence uh, uh, the behavior of enterprises, we will have unemployment. And after uh, quite a time, I understand that he was, to some degree, uh, right. Let us continue. Professor Toporowski is right that schools in economics are linked more with people than with places or institutions. In the years uh, 56, 55, 68, there existed in Warsaw an economic school of thought linked with Kalecki. After he resigned from this position in, the, uh, in this school in a sign of protest, against the anti-Semitic campaign of 1968, this school of thought disintegrated. I am convinced that no inaugural lecture in Poland over the last 20 years has been devoted or could have been devoted either to Lange or to Kalecki. In the course of those years, economics has become, in Poland, has become merely a rather provincial reflection of mainstream economic thinking. Lange is best known for his participation in the debate on economic calculation under socialism. Also, he wrote a lot of things in the other direction, he can be treated also as one of the co-founders of the neoclassical synthesis. But I will concentrate my remarks on this topic, on the so-called economic calculation under socialism. In this discussion, Lange sided with Valras against the Austrian school and proved that within the assumption of Valerian model, Mises' proposition about the impossibility of efficient allocation of resources under socialism was wrong. Theoretically, the Central Planning Board, by the trial and error method, could substitute 
for tatonment or the auctioneer functions. However, is the general equilibrium approach a correct representation of the market mechanism and of the capitalist economy? And if this is not the case, as many are convinced, would not Lange's solution cause greater losses as a piece of normative economy as opposed to a piece of positive theory only. In a capitalist economy, the most important functions of the entrepreneur are related to information he has and to motivation he dri he, uh, which drives his behavior. Within the Valerian analytical framework, entrepreneurs behave like robots that solve system of equation. And in this role, official of the central planning board, especially when equipped with modern computers, can surely replace the entrepreneurs. But can they also solve the problem of risk, of uncertainty, and responsibility for decisions made under these conditions? These are questions which Lange did not even ask because they are beyond the realm of general equilibrium theory. In this sense, I believe that Lange's victory in the discussion was a Pyrrhus one. In 1986, the Financial Times published an article of Professor Toporowski, Why the World Economy Needs a Financial Crash. That article, article as its author admitted some time ago, has had for quite a time a devastating effect on his career and shattered his belief on the role of economics ideas as a vehicle for progress of reason in economics and politics. Kalecki did not need such a lesson. He was not only a great thinker, but also a very much down-to-earth person. He had no illusions concerning the evolution, sorry, the evaluation of economic ideas on their merits alone. As Professor Toporowski reminded us in his today lecture, already 1943, much more than half a century ago, Kalecki stressed that knowledge of how to achieve and to continuously man maintain full employment might not be sufficient on its own to make the industrial leaders achieve that goal. They would dislike government interference in employment problems such as such. Moreover, they would dislike the directions of government spending, especially if the spending was to subsidize consumption. Last but not least, they would dislike the social and political consequences of continued maintenance of full employment. Kalecki was convinced that opposition to the policy of full employment would prevail even if in its absence, business would incur losses. According to him, discipline in factories and political stability would be more appreciated by industrial leaders than profit alone. By the way, I forgot to mention that Kalecki was very, very critical on Marxism. He was never a member of any political party, perhaps in the pre-war period, I don't know, of this movement of young people. Uh, 
I remember another uh, anecdote uh, when Kaleski said, look, if somebody studied Marxism, I was a, dogma, a Marxist, his head is lost. He is lost. So I say, hey, Professor, I was too a Marxist. So he says, perhaps you are different. <laughs> <laughs> Not different, perhaps. From this point of view, now let us come back to my uh, lecture as prepared. I spoke about his article about full employment. And if we look at this paper today, uh, our present experience of the financial crisis that started about five years ago is very enlightening. No significant changes, especially regarding the separation between commercial and investment banking, have yet been introduced. No conclusions regarding indispensable regulation of the financial industry have been drawn. What we see instead is a reinterpretation of the crisis. The, it seems the only subject which is relevant is state debt. By the way, in the year 1947, uh, sorry, in 2007, the debt uh, GDP relation in the United States was 500%. Of this, less than 100%, much less than 100%, was state debt. 400 was outside the state. The non financial, the financial sector alone had a debt of 125%. Well, the similar situation you have in Europe. Spain and Ireland had a very low uh, relation of state debt. The Baltic countries, almost nothing. And still, the consequences were very strong and are, for instance, in Spain, very important. Which means that what we see is the reinterpretation of the crisis, which was not a crisis of state debt, into a, into a fiscal problem. And this is needed in order to revive the do doctrine of sound finance. However, in a period of debt deleveraging of firms and private households, in developed economies, budget expenditures is the only source from which the required additional demand may come from. And yet, as we see especially in Europe, instead of deficit spending, budget discipline is requested. Well, somebody may, may say, well, if the crisis is related somehow to debt. How can more debt solve the crisis? Well, this is their point. The point is that this is a little bit paradoxical. But the system is paradoxical, not the answer. If we speak about income effect of investment, what does it mean? It means that what is important is not that they create places, capacity. It is important that they create jobs when, by the way, once Kalecki said, and this will be the end uh, remark, the problem with investments is they are productive. If they were, were not productive, then we could continue, continue, but they are productive and this makes, uh, creates a problem. Thank you very much. <laughs>